I almost always on a Shabbat morning speak about the Parsha. And I will a little bit later when I speak to Yuchana. But this Shabbat, if you read the bulletin, if you're one of the two people who opens up the Shabbat bulletin and read it, <laughs> you know that I'm dividing into two what in a religious learning community is a really significant event. And I'm not patting myself on the back when I say this. I'm, I'm elevating what Torah study and Talmud study means in a religious community. That when you complete a section of rabbinic material, particularly a tractate of Talmud, it's called a siyum. A siyum means a completion. And it's a celebration. It's such a powerful celebration that even if it were a day that would be a minor, a fast day for certain reasons, if you completed a siyum, on that day, it would actually give you the permission to eat. If you're in a period of the Jewish calendar where it would be prohibited to eat meat, which for me is all the time, if you did a siyum, that would permit you to eat meat. It's not a small thing. It's the way that our community for thousands of years has venerated and lifted up the idea of studying the words and the wisdom of our people. Now, some people have the intellectual and spiritual ability to study a page of Talmud every day. Not me. I'm doing it one page a week at a slower pace. It allows me to take in the material a little more slowly. And I've been studying Masachet Gitin, Tractate Gitin, which is the tractate which nominally deals with the laws of divorce. But every page of Talmud jumps into a hundred different directions. And I've been doing a page a week, and it's about 91 pages. So it's been taking take me almost two years to complete, and I just completed it. So what I'm doing is I'm going to teach you two sections right now, two of my favorite sections in the entire tractate, and then all of you, when you come back for Shabbos Mincha tonight at 720, you'll get to hear the resolution. The first one to laugh is the first one who shows up. Um, you'll notice that, uh, particularly if you come both nights, that both today and, and this evening, that not all the material I'm going to teach has to do with the topic of the tractate, because the only thing that's in every page of Talmud is everything, right? The only thing that you confront when you're studying the conversations of our sages from 2,000 years ago is every possible thing, every human urge, positive or negative, every spiritual pursuit, the ones which end up positively and the ones that do not, and every aspect of Jewish law, the same Jewish law that we're living out today. Here are the two sections that I want to teach with you, uh, study with this, this morning. Tanya Idach. Talmud says that it was taught in a separate text, the following verse from the Torah, Lo tazgir eved el adonav. You're not allowed to return a slave slash servant to his master. Just a word about slavery in the Torah and the Talmud. Slavery is never a good thing. Awful. It's a good thing that for the most part, it does not exist in our world, although it still does exist in certain places. The Torahs and the rabbinic version of slavery was not a good thing, but a very, very different thing than you're imagining in terms of American chattel slavery in the 16, 17, 1800s. It usually came as a result of someone not being able to pay off their debts, and they were claimed by the creditor until they were able to work it off. I'm not romanticizing it, but it's not what you're imagining in Alabama in the 1700s. Hundreds. But nevertheless, the Torah says, you are not allowed to return a slave or a servant to his owner. Rabbi Omer, Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, the editor of the Mishnah says, He narrows it. It doesn't feel good that he's narrowing this law because this seems like a wonderful law. You come across someone who's fled from his owner, don't return him. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi says it's a very specific case. It's a case where the person purchased... I know it's a hard word, the slave, in order to free him from slavery, situation is, I'm aware that some person is a slave to that guy over there. I can purchase him with my own money and therefore, thereby immediately release him. So I'm basically redeeming him from slavery. Rabbi says, in that situation, if this guy purchased that slave with the intent, the stated intent to release him, and then changes his mind, you know what? I like owning the slave. My chores around the house are being done much more quickly and easily. In that situation, you may not return the slave back to this person because the intent all along was for the person to be free. It's a limiting of a very wonderful biblical law. 
Hey, Chidami, Talmud asks, how is this actually done? Give me an exact, a simple case. Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, a rabbi named Nachman Bar Yitzchak said, Dikativle hachi. It's as when the person bought the slave, he said, when I purchase you, it's as if I'm purchasing you for your own freedom. That's how it has to be done. Okay, now we have a story. Very Talmudic twist. You have a law and then a story which kind of makes the, the law a little more complicated. And it's also a wonderful story that reminds us that our great sages who gave us the tradition that we're still living at right now were, going back to what Hannah said, imperfect, striving humans. Rav Chizda Arakle Avda Levechute. Rav Chizda had a slave. Rabbi Chizda had a slave. And he fled to the Kutim, which is the Talmud's way of referring to the Samaritans, a sect of ancient uh, residents of the land of Canaan who did not accept rabbinic law. They lived exactly by the Torah. They're still Samaritans alive today. And so this slave gets, goes to a place that he thinks will be free. Shalach lahu, Rabbi Chista sent to them, Adruha uh, nihle, give me back my slave. Shlachule, they said back to him, uh, Rabbi Chista, don't you know your own Torah? And they quote the verse, Lo taskir eved adonav, you cannot return a servant to his master, so you're out of luck. Shlach lahu, he said back to them, I do know the Torah, and I know another verse, and he starts quoting, V'chein ta'asel lechamoro, this is what you should also do for someone's a donkey. And this is what you should do for a person's garment. And this is what you should do for anything that was lost to a person. Meaning, when you come upon something that belongs to someone else, you are obligated by Torah law to return it. So don't quote back to me that you can't return a, servant's, a servant to his owner. The Torah also says, you find something lost that belongs to someone else, you must return it. They said back to him. Yeah, that doesn't trump the other verse that says, you don't return a servant to his master. Shlach lahu, he sends the back. You can imagine this tug of war. Hahu be'eved shebarach mechutza la'aretz la'aretz. There is another source in the Talmud that says, yeah, that verse only applies if someone has fled from outside the land of Israel to the land of Israel. It's kind of an Israel happy law. If someone has fled slavery from the diaspora and has come into the land of Israel, don't send them back, not only to enslavement, but also to diaspora. Keep that person in the land of Israel. And it's according to this teacher, Achai, the son of Rabbi Yeshua. Why does Rabbi Chizka teach that interpretation of the verse, which is not the only interpretation of the verse? There are interpretations of the verse that would require him to understand that he's not going to get his servant back. The next three, four Aramaic words are incredibly revealing in terms of the rabbi's understanding of how texts and ideas can be manipulated in your own favor. Why did he choose that interpretation of the verse? Mishum demash kra'e. Because they helped his argument. He, of course, chose the interpretation of the biblical verse that was going to get him, his servant, back rejecting the interpretation of the verse that was going to allow the servant to be free. The fact that the Talmud codifies that, retains it, preserves it. Rabbi Chizka is not, as my teacher Rabbi Roth would say, a nachshlepper. He's not a nothing. He's a teacher from whom we get enormous amounts of learning about how to live our lives with Torah. And he's in a situation, and he's an economic person as well, and his servant fled, and he's got a verse in his back pocket, and he knows because he knows his material. Yeah, there's an interpretation of this verse that says, I shouldn't get him back, but I also know an interpretation of this verse that says that I should get him back because he was not fleeing from the land, outside the land of Israel to the land of Israel. It was the reverse. That's the way the Talmud ends the story. There's no resolution. Is this a critique of Rav Chista? How convenient to just wield the law in a way that's going to make your bank account grow. Is this reality that all of us sometimes unconsciously, sometimes consciously, will quote the article or quote the ruling or quote the lenient rabbi that allows us to do what it is that we want to do? It's hard to know because the Talmud doesn't offer a commentary on itself. It leaves it there for you to deal with. This rabbi was aware that there was a verse that could be wielded against him, 
and he quoted the version of the interpretation that wielded it in his favor. And then we're supposed to just sit on that. It's a little bit uncomfortable, although I think that's the way people operate, and apparently it's the way people have operated for 2,000 years and more. And speaking about the way people have operated for 2,000 years and still do, source number two. Amar Rava, one of the great teachers of the Talmud, Rava says, this is going to be a strange idea as well, just as if you try to betroth yourself to half a woman, I want to tell you what that means in a second, in ancient rabbinic law and in modern rabbinic law, marriage is a transaction. You're not acquiring a person. It was never acquisition of a person, but it was acquire, uh, acquisition of, of intimate access, for lack of a better word. Maybe that is the exact right word. And so sometimes the rabbis play math games and concept games, even though it never actually happened in practice. Right? So the question was asked, let's say I want to betroth this woman, but I only want to claim that I have access to half of her or half of the time of her. Rabbi says, if you try to betroth half of a woman, it's done nothing. You have not betrothed anything. Just as that's accepted law, everyone accepts that. It's also the case that if the person were half of a maidservant, half of a slave, and half free, what does that mean? Again, it was indeed somewhat commonplace that in the ancient world that someone could be owned by someone else to pay off a debt. And let's say the person was able to pay off half the debt. And there was actually a situation where the, the debtor said to the creditor, I can buy half of it back. You own Ha or the, or the, actually the person themselves could pay off half the debt. I half belong to you, but I half belong to me. I'm half independent, but I'm half claimed. I owe half of my productivity to you, but half of the productivity that I do, I can do, in my, oh, I can do for myself. Rather makes the case. That's also, if you try to buy someone who's half free and half enslaved or half claimed, that doesn't do anything. Darash Rabba Barbahuna. Rabbi Barbarhuna, a different rabbi, says the same law. Yeah, that makes sense. If you can't um, half betroth a person, then you shouldn't be able to betroth a person who's only half accessible, half available. Amarle Rav Chista, our friend Rav Chista from the previous source, said back to him, Mi Dami, are those two situations the same? Hatam Shier Bikinyano, Hachalo Shier Bikinyano. In the first case, the person could have purchased or could have betrothed the entire woman, chose not to. So he left over a part of the acquisition that he had full capability of doing. That's why that is invalid. In our case, if you try to betroth someone who's half available, half not, and you betroth the only part that is available, you haven't left over something. You've not left something undone. Those two cases shouldn't be similar. You should be al allowed to betroth such a person. Hadar Okem Rabba Barbarhuna, the rabbi who quoted the, the law that said you're not allowed to betroth someone who's half free and half claimed, he stood up another um, fellow colleague in his presence and he said, Udarash, Hanachashela Hazot Tachat Yedacha. He quotes from the uh, prophet Isaiah and says, Let this Mechashela, this stumbling block, this thing that you're going to trip over, be underneath your hand. And then he said, Ein adam omeid Torah, you never really establish yourself and stand on your own words of Torah, on your own teaching, Ella imkein until the first time you've stumbled on them and failed and made a mistake and recognized it. Really powerful statement. No matter how much you know about anything, I would add, you really have no claim of mastery over it until you have failed as a result of it and then try to rebuild yourself through acknowledging your mistake. Whether your field is politics or economics or philosophy or math or physics or rabbinic law, until you recognize that you don't know everything and can learn from someone else's interpretation and claim that you've made a mistake and you've changed your mind, you know nothing. You may know a lot about physics, but you know nothing about what it means to be a thinker. You may know a lot about the Torah, but you don't know anything about what God intended us for, to do in the Torah. In other words, he said, you're right. I'm wrong. How often did we hear that in 2024? 
I thought that I was making an apt analogy. You've pointed out the analogy is an apt. I'm going to change my mind. I guess it's the case that even though it says that if you try to betroth half a person in a mekudeshet, they're not betrothed. Someone who's half claimed, the chatziah b'chorin, half free. Shemit kasha. If you try to betroth such a person, kedusheha kedushin. Those, but that betrothal is effective. There's no one I know who wouldn't benefit on some level from taking in both of these small sections of a piece of rabbinic writing that was codified almost 2,000 years ago. One, a recognition, maybe without, without comprehensive shame, but a little bit of an acknowledgement that we all wield texts, laws, permissions, and ideas to our benefit, and usually to the detriment of the people we already disagree with, and there's very little objectivity and how we read the news, and how we wield the information, we might as well acknowledge that, because you can't start effacing it unless you acknowledge it. And the second one, when was the last time you felt really confident in a position? And then someone countered it, and your response was, I hadn't thought of it that way. I was making an association too flimsily. It, was, it felt good to say it because it was convenient for me. But now that you've expressed it to me another way, I recognize I was in error. And I'm going to change my mind. And I'm going to change my mind publicly. I'm going to gather my colleagues around me and say, it was my mistake. Don't follow what I was going to say. Because what I was going to say was going to lead you the wrong way. If we had some acceptance and recognition of source number one, that we do a version of this nearly every day, and some leaning in to source two, pushing us to acknowledge publicly when we've made a mistake, can you imagine what our society would be like? Can you imagine what it would be like to live religiously and live Americanly and live Jewishly if everyone were open and alert and admitting to this way of creating society of ideas? The Talmud hasn't been changed in 2,000 years, but it's still changing us.